I will start with the ORCID. So in our sleep lab is opioid-induced central sleep apnea. This was a young lady, 26 years old. She really had bad luck first. Uh, she had bone cancer surgery, then problems with the, with the hip on the contralateral side. There was a nerve lesion after this uh, surgery and she developed severe chronic uh, pain syndrome and uh, she was bound to wheelchair, had very high doses of opioids. And you see the breathing pattern, she, she usually had two breaths, a short, pure central apnea, this is heartbeat, um, and a very high AHI with short apneas. What's important in opioid-induced central sleep apnea is to measure uh, CO2, because textbook knowledge is opioids uh, may lead to hypoventilation, but this is not very often the case. Um, most of opioid patients we see have uh, normal capnia or even hypocapnia. Also this case, uh, she was normal capnic. Um, we have to, to try CPAP uh, first, and when you have seen the breathing pattern, that's what we expect. It, it doesn't change at all on CPAP. So in this case, we applied adaptive serve ventilation because she was normal capnic, uh, short the, the pressure setting. So we have the variable EPUB, which is, works like an auto CPUB device, usually from 5 to 12. Then we have the pressure support. We usually set the minimum to zero to, to avoid triggering problems when there are no events, so different to the Servage F trial, and, um, and maximum uh, pressure, inspiratory pressure support, usually 10 is enough, and the default automatic backup rate to ventilate during central apneas. And uh, on ASV, uh, the patient had a good response. Most of the time it was uh, pure ventilation, like a BiPAP, ST, and in REM sleep, when we have uh, the likelihood for central apneas is lower, uh, we saw the spontaneous breathing of the patient, and actually this, the sleep pattern uh, was not optimal, but imp it improved significantly, and also the patient had a symptom relief, and, and the, ex the excessive daytime sleepiness improved in this patient. Um, the statements from the task force paper, uh, number one is to reduce the opioids if possible. We, um, we had some success in this case and therefore we have to restudy sleep apnea in this, uh, uh, in this young lady. And um, most data suggest that both ASV and bilevel positive pressure are superior to conventional CPAP for elimination of opioid associated. CSA. And then is the question, when do we use bilevel pub ST or when ASV? Uh, the task force formulated the members of the task force use uh, bilevel pub ST uh, or other stimulants <coughs> in uh, normal or hypocapnic CSA related to uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction if adequate trials of indicated therapies fail. Um, so that, that means we only use BiPAP ST in hypercapnia because this is uh, the indication it was, was built for. And um, this statement is based on, on uh, Teschler's uh, study from 2001 in heart failure patients. Uh, we are several uh, therapies, oxygen, CPAP, and ASV led to a normalization or increase of the low PCO2, but with bilevel PUP ST, usually we ventilate too much in these patients and uh, fail to normalize the PCO2, and that's why we uh, don't like to use it in hypocapnic uh, patients. Um, 
so this is this is the main message. Uh, so we have to uh, distinguish between normal or hypocapnia patients in central sleep apnea. And another important point, um, I think we we should not uh, treat central sleep apnea with an HI of six or seven. Uh, I think the relevant severity begins uh, above 15, although this is, of course, also arbitrary. <laughs>